here in all its porcelain glory, and I'm here to tell you this, <laughs> is the first British radio show to be transmitted on television. See for the first time Peter Sellers saying words you could only previously hear on radio. Oh, it's too about a word so <laughs> Not only that, but see and hear Spike Milligan is Minnie Bannister singing... <laughs> <laughs> see England's tallest dwarf, Harry Seacom, is, as he says, what, what, what? Personally. What, what, what? Personally. <laughs> this <laughs> is the Goon Show. The highly skilled whistling I'm finish it, you twist. <laughs> Oh, fire a gun or something. Finished, thank you. The highly skilled whistling tune. It must be the noble echoes. Huzzah. Oh. Ah! <laughs> Captain Jigun, hang up! Oh, who are you? Mother Brown. Need up. Need up, Mother Brown. Need up, Mother Brown. Crush me, Crundles, it's Villian de Paprican. Moriarty, knee trembler, head of the dreaded highly secret. <laughs> Mysterious whistling Hungarian counter espionage. I've also played the lead in several French postcards. <laughs> uh, it's Marinati. You've gone bold. Fire. What, what is that lamp on your neck? That is the difference between margarine. <laughs> I know. I know what we can do. Let's play Mothers and Milkmen. <laughs> can be the blue tit that pecks the top of the cream. <laughs> <laughs> I heard it my groin. Blue button, you little devil. What were you doing at my trousers? A man has to do what he has to do. These were my childhood heroes. I became almost obsessed with them. And I'm glad that I did, because many years later I was able to understand the audience response to Monty Python in a way that I would never have done if I hadn't been so such a fan of that show. It was rather like hearing Elvis Presley doing Heartbreak Hotel uh, for the first time. You knew this was very, very different, and it wasn't just that my father sort of looked askance at the radio when he heard it. Um, it was that there was something in the form of it that was different. That trace up against the wall. Whose is it? Mine. A present from an admirer. <laughs> Could you drive it to town on it? Oh, the tricycle isn't mine. The wall was the present. <laughs> well, drive me there on that. Right, hold tight. It was a picture in Spike's mind. It was a picture in their mind. And just the enjoyment, the enjoyment of language as well. So this was said, you jest. Just what? You just told me that. And the enjoyment comes searing through. Lord Seagram, ask a native where we are. Right, sir. I'll knock on this oyster. Yes? Oh. Is Pearl in? <laughs> But I'm her mother. Of course, you must be mother of Pearl. It was just very loose. It was very... It could flip off anywhere. And, uh, and it, it fuels your imagination. If you listen to it, 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 it gives you the possibilities of where you could go, which is anywhere. I'm walking backwards Christmas Across the Irish I'm walking backwards for Christmas. It's the finest thing for me. I'm trying walking sideways and walking to the front. They just look at me and say it's a publicity stunt. I've come across a um, strange marooned, uh, landlocked goon uh, enthusiasts in upstate New York. You know, people who come to you um, from from Ithaca, I remember, who say, um, "I am the um, I am the president of the Ithaca chapter of the Coon Show uh, fan club." All hail! <laughs> How interesting to find you in this neck of the woods. Wow! Goon Island, Newman's Keeper. I wonder if they mean me. Huh? Uh. 
Pop, by one of his uh, adventures, came across this uh, this race of people, like Stone Age men with huge forearms. That must be a goon from Goonie Island, I guess. And they spoke in squiggles, and they were called goons. And I think it was Mike Benteen who suggested that would be the name for the show. My first impression tonight, we should like to give you the grand toast at the optician's ball. <laughs> Gentlemen. <laughs> At that very moment, Germany declared war in all directions. Bang! <laughs> Wasn't worth the journey. <laughs> Come on, Ricky. Here come the goons. What about that? We've had it. Oh, I must strike me memoirs. The day war broke out. Winston said to me, got to stop, bloody. We can't go on meeting like this, you know. <laughs> Radio shows, like Take It From Here, like, like The Goosen, got figures which soaps get today. And, in fact, radio comedy shows were more akin to, to today's television soaps than they are to today's television comedy shows, they had an enormous audience. The audience treated them as a regular event in their lives and they had shared experiences with the audience. The audience and the goons had been through the war together. Now, that was the experience which we all could have died. Permission to speak, Harry Major? Permission granted, Harry Prisoner. I would like... Sai Lung, Volkish will be a better. Kablung and Kabutsi Sik Empire, Grundang. Does your wife know this? Shut up! <laughs> Achtung! Gebluden geblutz! Admit it, you're a spy. I'm not a spy, I'm a shepherd. Ah, shepherd spy! <laughs> I think, in a way, people like Spike and Harry were matured by the war, and that gave a certain depth to their characterization, which they wouldn't have had if they hadn't been through that. Let's put it this way. I couldn't have done without it. <laughs> I had to have it. I had to have World War II to make me find myself, you know. Peter Sellers was a different... He was an actor all the time. Milligan and uh, Seacombe, in a sense, were being themselves carried to excess, if you like. What time is it? Half past five. Half past five? Yeah. Well, don't get up till eight. Ah, oh, but you're in the army now. When I first met him in North Africa, I'd been downgraded from having shell shock, and he was at this depot as well, and I didn't understand him. I, I thought he was a stand-up Polish comic. <laughs> and the first time I saw him out was in action. He was hidden in a battle dress, steel glasses, steel glasses. So you wouldn't get wounded, I suppose. And I thought, my God, he must be worth a panther division to Hitler. We had the same zany sense of humour. Anyway. We just hit it off straight away. When I was involved, I went to the Wimble Theatre for an audition, got the job, and there was this act called Sherwood and Forest. Forrest, who was actually Mike Benteen, played the drums. And I said, you know, you must meet this mate of mine, Milligan, he's on the same kick as us. So we went down to this uh, pub, the, uh, the Grafton Arms in Stratton Ground. I'd met up with the, the bloke who ran it, called Jimmy Grafton, an ex-major. And we had a great time. And then Jimmy Grafton was full of uh, the same kind of ideas, you know, iconoclasm, anti-establishment stuff. And by this time... Um, I met Peter Sellers on a radio broadcast and realised that there was another idiot. So he used to come to the, come to the Graftons and, uh, you know, muck in with the rest of us. And now an incident that happened in the shop the other day. The man behind the counter and three young men rushed in to beat him. I'm behind the counter. Excuse me. <laughs> Could we have a cup of heavy stand, please? I'm sorry, gentlemen. This is the recruiting of it. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> it was a loose assembly of very hungry young comics Eventually, by sheer hunger, 
we were forced to do something. <laughs> and lo, somebody said, well, how about, how about doing a non-hungry show? We get paid. So we went to Pat, Pat Dixon. Pat Dixon was revolutionary. He had the uh, Confederate flag behind him like this. And uh, he looked at this script and he said, yes, yes, uh, I'll do it. And that, that, was a, that was the right answer for us. Now, Pat Dixon was enthusiastic about uh, getting the Goon Show on the air, but he didn't particularly want the hassle of producing it himself, and so he arranged for other people to actually produce the show. Oh, Mr. Mm-hmm. Producer, what are the goons? The goons are absolutely mad, but they're the stars of the show. <laughs> okay. Stand by. On you now. Hello? Eagle foot splat muscle here. I'll never sleep. Listen, Pinhead, this is Cat Legs McGillan here. Why did I get that fight grand in one hour? It's curtains for you. Oh, <laughs> oh that goes. Oh, uh, you? If I don't get $4,000 within the hour, I'm going to get killed. Oh, uh, uh, what's the time now? <laughs> Two o'clock. Oh, don't worry, boss. I'll ring Jake. Oh, hello, Jake. Oh, can you fix a funeral for three o'clock? Oh, hello, all cars blood muscle here. Ever vigilant. Oh, it's blood muscle. My husband's just been shot. I've just come into the front room and found him lying on the carpet there. Oh, is he dead? I think so. Oh, hadn't you better make sure? All right, just a minute. He's dead. <laughs> The one I had from Michael Standing, who was the head of uh, entertainment at the time, was, you can't go to the Goon Show, nobody would know who the Goons are. To which I said, well, then nobody knew who Take It From Here was. When it thought, and it, it still didn't win. So we had to do Crazy People. And they thought, because there was a show at the Palladium called Crazy Gang, they would call us the Junior Crazy Gang. Are you watching, you bastards? You've probably seen a photograph of the boys in my office, me with a mallet in my hand. Mm-hmm. And this was a push thing we did. Uh, it's me persuading the boys to sign the contract for the second series. And they're refusing, unless we can call it the Goon Show. We knew that quite, quite as a deliberate setup, and we, we got our own way. We'd been going, I think, uh, about a year, perhaps. And they had a planners meeting, and one senior producer got up and said, There's Go on show. What's it all about? Who are these go ons? I mean, they, it took them a long time to uh, absorb what we were doing. This is the BBC. Hold it up to the light. Not a brain in sight. <laughs> when your producer with Spark Milligan, he is a mixture of resenting the fact that you are BBC and uh, also wishing to get on with you in order to get the programme done. So you always had this ambivalence between. Uh, Spike and yourself, and uh, it could raise problems of temperament at times. I was trying to shake the BBC out of its apathy, you know, knock, uh, knock sound effects when knock on the door and trunch on gravel. That was it, and I tried to transform it, and I had to fight like mad, and people didn't like me for it, and I had to rage and bang and crash, and uh, I got it all right in the end, and it paid off, but it uh, drove me mad in the process and drove a lot of other people mad, and that's why I, I don't think I could be a success again on that same level, because I just couldn't go through all the tantrums. My experiences with Spike is that he would sometimes sacrifice the easy in order to try to explore. He was on the edge of a cliff, and he was determined to jump off to see whether there was a better way of doing something. Michael seemed very much more rooted in a particular type of of comedy that he had developed. It was a narrower box than Spike's. Michael seemed more concerned about a proprietorial sense of this is this is my world. In our country's hour of the direst need, they threw down the pen and then they took up the gun and. <laughs> Exactly the self-same chaps are sort of sweating it out and working away in the fields, the factories and the, and the forest. You know, in order to keep our glorious flag of empire still flying. Spike and Mike would be, we'd all be chatting together about doing the show. Or like, doing the rehearsals, perhaps. And Spike would have an idea and it would be picked up by Mike and then he'd throw it back. And so it was a sort of ping-pong thing. But at the end... 
Both of them go away and think that that joke was his. It was really, it was an amalgam of their own ideas. There were never any sort of stand-up rows, but uh, there was a bit of needle now and again, which is good, I think. It, you know, competition is, makes you work harder. I just laughed. <laughs> If you want volunteer, we must draw lots. Heckles? Yeah, I will. <laughs> Write your name on a piece of paper and put it in this hat. Right. There. Now, draw it out. There. Now, read the name on the paper. Mrs. Phyllis Quartz. <laughs> you swine! You're an imposter! You're not Mrs. Phyllis Quartz. I am! Darling! <laughs> How he brought that energy, um, and 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 um, what what what? Isn't it terrible when you have to discard the word gaiety? But but that's what it was. Uh, Harry was was carried. He bubbled it along. He was the carrier wave, as it were, on which all the other things went up and down. It was energy in sound. How join the navy? <laughs> It's too damn noisy in the Navy. That needed the courage that a good musician has to know how long to go on, when to change key. When, and, I mean, nobody else in, in radio uh, made that use of repetition, of pure sound, of letting things go on way beyond the point where any normal person would say, that's enough, that's... That's enough. It, they'll get fed up with it. But he went like two, two miles beyond that. Um, that's still never been equaled. Music was very important. The warm-up was started off with a Ray Ellington quartet, and I'd come out and sing "Falling in Love with Love" while they did terrible things behind me. Variety was hard work, but if you get onto radio, then people come to see you because they want to, they want to see what the what the face behind the voice looked like. First of all, let's take a small boy shaving for the first time. <laughs> I was travelling with them, and it was the only time I recollect the goon show going out on a tour. And then he finds he's got no blade in. The sweat would be pouring off hanging, and he'd say, was I all right, was I, was, it's all right. He says, I mean, full of anxiety. And the lovely thing he would always do at the end of his performance, because he was so delighted at all this applause coming from the audience and this great warmth he had for them and them for him, he would beckon to the spike at the side, come on, come on, come and share it with me. <laughs> at three o'clock one morning, the phone went. <laughs> it was Peter, and he said, will you come round right away? I said, well, I'm not unconscious. What do you mean, come round? <laughs> He said, <laughs> bit late, hurry up, yeah. see you again. <laughs> and he said, please come out. So I thought he was having trouble with one of his wives. One was leaving or one was coming in. Or, or they both collided. <laughs> <laughs> both collided. <laughs> so I just put my overcoat over my uh, pyjamas and got my mini minor. When I drove there, he was sitting outside. It's just three in the morning, wintertime, snow on the ground. And the engine running, I said, what's this? He said, look, 
this is a brand new Rolls Royce. I said, you could have told me that on the phone. I'd have believed you. <laughs> he said, uh, no, look, he said, he said, there's a, a squeak in the boot. I said, y yes. He said, well, look, it, he said, well, take this piece of chalk and this torch, and I want you to get in the boot, and, I close it, and I'm going to drive it up and down the street, and when you hear a, when you hear a squeak, but you can't make these stories up, they've got to happen, right? <laughs> He said, make a little cross. So I thought, what do I... So I got in, stand good, and he drove this Rolls Royce up and down on the pavements like this to shake the springs. <laughs> the police must have seen him, because I heard a car pull up and then crunch of gravel. And, <laughs> and then suddenly, I don't know how you'd feel, but a, a torch, a policeman shot his torch on me in the boot. <laughs> and he, he said, oh, it's you. <laughs> I can think of Spike in, on one particular occasion. He took a great dislike to the audience, a very strong dislike. And so after the first performance when he came off, he went up to his dressing room and he had a very good voice, Spike, as you know. He could sing jolly well and he played the trumpet very well. Then he was singing Laura and then he played this wonderful solo on the trumpet. Well, come the second house, he just didn't appear. I mean, locked himself in the dressing room. He didn't want to have anything more to do with the audience. Can you believe it? I mean, we, we all have to get on there, but he didn't. That was Spike. Hello. You silly, twisted boy. <laughs> Once you'd heard grit pipe thin or echoes, you could never forget them. Well, it wasn't a character that would just drift away. And he created them incredibly vividly, and then he knew how to play them off against each other. So he had this extraordinary little group of characters, and then each one had different relationships with everyone. And it was, it was a world of his own, and the greatest comedy writers do exactly that. They create a world of their own. A complete world, yes. And, and not too far removed from this one. Although people think, oh, it's just anarchy. And it's, it wasn't anarchy. I mean, some of the, I mean, some of the jokes uh, that Spike wrote into that, which were um, it was a very funny one, was when, when the teacher was trying to t teach Eccles about the law of gravity. And, uh, and he said, uh, there's, there's a law. See, there's a law of gravity. Go, yeah. yeah, but <clears throat> you see... You see, things fall down. No, but there's a pull. He said, I'll, let, let, I'll tell you what, jump up in the air. He said, oh, great. And he jumps up in the air and he said, what well, happened? You came back to earth, didn't you? He said, yeah. He said, why? He said, because I live here. Now, f jokes like that are absolutely spot on, but uh, different. What are you doing down here? Everybody got to be somewhere. <laughs> I think Eccles uh, represents Spike in a way that none of the other characters do. I've always told him that I think that Eccles is the true Milligan and the rest is just a, a cover. And he's right, yes. yes, yes. That's it, man, you know. I don't want to know about thinking and all that thing about earning money. I just want to be an idiot. <laughs> I'll tell you something. No. I, I looked up my dad's trousers once. <laughs> And I discovered something. <laughs> what? That's where he keeps his legs. <laughs> Bottle? <laughs> you ever seen your daddy's legs? <laughs> no. <laughs> he always takes him to work with him. <laughs> Anyway, this tall fellow, he got a little briefcase and he got the scout hat, but he got a big red beard with all this. And, and, and red knees and socks and all the insignia, you know. And he said, and I'm not kidding, this is how he spoke, he said, um, could I come in for a moment, please? <laughs> no. And I thought, what is this? Is this? So I said, I said, yes, certainly, please, what can I do for you? He said, Maka, I have just seen Maka Benteen. At Chiswick, <laughs> and he said that I'm a genius. <laughs> <laughs> then he went on to ask me about doing a concert at the Salgrave Road Boys Club or something, you see. So um, I said, no, I, you know, I don't think, you know, it's like Saturday night uh, after Saturday night. It was on the, uh, you know, after the show on Saturday night, I'd pack up my... Uh, you know, it was the last thing I really wanted to do at that stage, especially if he was an example of what I was going to find down there. <laughs> 
So he said, uh, he thought he took this as a hint. He said, there, um, there is a fee involved. <laughs> so I said, no, it's not a question of money. I assure you, uh, really, I, I would come, but I just can't, you know, at the moment. So he stood there for a second. He said, oh, well, just a thought. <laughs> <laughs> So he found out blue bottle. <laughs> well, I was, I, I was at school and the uh, uh, troop were going to open a fate and uh, they asked me to find somebody to open it. So I went to the Chiswick Empire and I said to um, Michael Benteen, you know, and he said, clever idea, you're a genius. Now, apparently that is a, a code word between the, the boys. You've got a muggins on your hand here. But I didn't know that, of course. <laughs> the Eccles and Blue Bottle are the crumpled characters and... In comedy, you almost need them. Um, just someone who's, who's so low status that it's off the scale. Good night, Henry. Good night, men. <laughs> Did you take your male hormone pills? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh. Yes. They give me the strength to go to sleep, men. <laughs> Yes, I know. Meanwhile, in the smallest and coldest room in the house, in a fort on the northwest frontier, Major Dennis Bloodnock is having difficulties. Oh, no more curried eggs for me. <laughs> the great, great thing about listening to the goons was that it was a series of wonderful anticipations as to when your character was going to come in. And, and in between, there were characters that were sometimes different each week that you've not heard before or whatever. Mariate, take a letter in gargling fluid. <laughs> Dear General, <laughs> according to the shape of my knees, <laughs> I believe that an illegal raffle <laughs> for the equator is being held. <laughs> And for certain monies, I will reveal the organizer. Let's have that back, please. It depended on completely impossible situations and, and impossible logical jokes about uh, being inside and outside a room at the same time, at being able to travel at enormous speeds um, into not just simply... Uh, destinations in space, but destinations in time. So they would undertake, for example, route marches t to next year. Um, now, all that really couldn't, c could only happen either on paper, as it does with Lewis Carroll, or in sound radio, as it did with the goons. The Mad Hatter's Tea Party, we won't get worse than that. It's chaos. It's wonder that Alice... Let it all happen. I love the dormouse being constantly dipped into this teapot to make a cup of tea. And I sort of kept reading that because it gave me a buzz. What's in the teapot? A, a man. <laughs> he says he wants to see you. Come on up. <laughs> now, sir, will you explain why you are hiding in the teapot? I had a date with a tea bag. One of the key things about the goons was the delight in language, the delight in language for its own sake. Um, I hope I do that in the Discworld books, but I think the, 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 uh, that what I owe most of them is the fact that they went there, they opened up new territory. It was up to me and lots of other people to come along afterwards and build cabins and cities and carve little farms out of the wilderness. But they were the guys that went out there first and actually said, hey, you know, there is some, there's a whole new continent here, guys. And the rest of us were just colonists. What's that rough sailor song you sing, seaman? <laughs> I'm singing this map. Oh, the brown parts are the land, da da, da da, and the blue bits are the sea, da 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 da. Going to run a night, going to run a day, to show what poison I'm my lung, da 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 da. Oh, now they don't write maps like that anymore. Milligan has a tremendous sense of conceptual humour. There's a moment at which someone gets charged something, it costs a certain amount of money. And someone says, well, here is a photograph of five pounds. And the man then says, well, here is a drawing of three and six change. Well, now, that's not a linguistic joke. That's a wonderful joke about the notion and the meaning of money, about what, in fact, counts as a valuable token. The idea of a photograph of a 
token and the idea of a drawing of a token draws attention to the fact that a pound note itself is nothing more than a token, which doesn't have intrinsic value at all. It simply has um, authentic value because it's printed by the mint. So why shouldn't a photograph of the same thing also carry value, and why shouldn't a drawing? So I think that um, there is a level of... Uh, imagination, which I think goes beneath language to something much more fundamental, and that is to the basic structure of thought itself. Look! We are saved! Look! A house! It is a house! A house, a yes. house. It's not, it's a mirror! Don't such as a house surrounded by trees! Let's go in! Yeah! I still say it's a mirror! Nonsense! Blue bottle Eccles! Search the house for food! All right, then. <laughs> so, blood knock. You think this house is a mirage, eh? <laughs> You'll soon see! <laughs> It's vanished. Gone. Are you all right? A mirage. I told you it was. Oh! oh. Eccles, what happened? I went upstairs. <laughs> he played enormously with these jokes about representation. And I think that, um, <clears throat> that Milligan, in some intuitive way, I think he would probably recoil at the thought of being thought of as an intellectual or as an academic or as someone who was dealing with something as serious as logic. But the dear old thing really has to face up to the fact that he was creating art because his imagination was in touch with things which really are of great interest to logicians and of great interest to psychologists who are now preoccupied with the basic deep structures of thought. I think one of the most perfect pieces of radio writing is the piece where Eccles writes the time down on a piece of paper. <laughs> what time is it, Eccles? <laughs> uh, just a minute, I, I got it written down here on a piece of paper. <laughs> and a nice man wrote the time down for me this morning. Then why do you carry it around with you, I guess? Well, um, if uh, anybody asks me the time, <laughs> I, I can show it to them. Wait a minute, I guess, my good man. <laughs> what is it, fellow? It's written on this bit of paper. What is eight o'clock is written? I know that, my good fellow. That's right. Um, when I asked a fella to write it down, it was eight o'clock. Well, then, supposing when somebody asks you the time, it isn't eight o'clock. Well, then I don't show it to them. <laughs> well, how do you know when it's eight o'clock? I got it written down on a piece of paper. <laughs> I wish I could afford a piece of paper with a time written on. Oh, Here, yes. Echo. Yeah? Let me hold that piece of paper to my ear, would you? Here. This piece of paper ain't going. What? I've been told a forgery. No wonder it stopped at eight o'clock. Oh, dear. You should get one of them things my granddad's got. Oh. His firm give it to him when he retired. Oh. It's one of them things, what it is, that wakes you up at eight o'clock, boils the kettle, and pours a cup of tea. Oh, yeah. Um, what's it called? Um? My grandma. <laughs> Oh, oh, wait a minute. How does she know when it's eight o'clock? She got it written down on a piece of paper. <laughs> it is comedy. They should, they should teach that in schools. They should, as an example of using... I mean, that's a jazz riff. been asked by the BBC <laughs> to get the audience warmed up. 
Well, to the best of my knowledge, there is no better way than by the gentleman using their right hand to squeeze the top of the lady's thigh next to them. Splendid. I will now whistle the soliloquy from Hamlet. He wasn't so much uh, an impressionist as a chameleon. And you stand next to Peter, and, and he'd be doing the voice of Crun, and he'd become Crun physically. And then when he became blood knock, he blew himself out. And his face altered, uh, and his physical shape altered. And it was quite amazing, like a transformation. Strange, but very, very clever. Sir, what do you think? What, well, mate? No. <laughs> I don't know, mate. I'm only to bleed and clean around here. <laughs> I'm sorry, I... I thought you were one of us. No, I'm one of them, mate. <laughs> you don't look like one of them. I know I don't. <laughs> we weren't allowed to use anything naughty, you know, but we got away with doing the, just the payoffs of rather naughty army jokes, which would make those in the know front hysterical, but were completely innocuous in themselves. But we get letters from old ladies in Cheltenham complaining about the filth, and really... They must have known the joke in the first place. My name is Jampton. Captain Hugh Jampton. <laughs> but we use a rapier, not a bludgeon, you understand. It was mischievous and dangerous. That was something, for me, you know, it was more like sort of what we used to do at school, you know, sort of when, when, when teacher wasn't looking. Like children being let out of school. That's the only way I can describe it. And, and we always, you could always hear in the background Peter giggling or me giggling or Spike giggling. Little private joke sometimes that you don't repeat. <laughs> Get up, Milligan, I'll thump you in a minute. Now step on your foot, boy. Come the time! You caught me twice. I think that um, the Sunday get together used to sort of, you know, put a charge into Spike, and, and, and the thing used to get off the ground. We really had a marvellous time. It was probably, as I say, I, I think looking back, uh, the most happy time professionally I've ever spent. But for Spike, having to keep up the standard all the time, you know, it was difficult for him. And, uh, I mean, it, it resulted in a, a breakdown of his health, and I, th I don't think it helped his marriage, his first marriage. I was married, and I had a little girl, and I thought, I've got to earn some money. This... this company gives me money and I got £12.10 a week for writing it and uh, it went on. Mind you, it went on and in the end it went up to 150 yeah. That must have hurt them. They must have counted the money out the night before. Oh, Eccles Smeckles, my lovely boy. <laughs> They're going to make a lot of money for me. We sold every seat in the play. What are they going to sit on? <laughs> you see, when uh, Spike was uh, really having a bad time, because it really was such a hectic show he did, we, we shared an office over a green grocer's in uh, Shepherd's Bush, and he said, would I help him to write it? Because he, he was very exhausted. So I, I, I helped him for a few shows. And... Uh, what I remember mostly about helping to, to, to do those few shows was the laughs that we had in the writing of it. But I want to, I, I want to disassociate myself from having invented any of it. All I was doing, I went in there to copy, and it was a great, uh, great part of my life, that. In fact, I had four mental breakdowns. Now, I don't know whether it was the pressure of the show doing it to me or whether I was just by nature a manic depressive. Perhaps it made the writing funnier. <laughs> Here is a preview of next winter in Jimmy Grafton's attic. Yeah, can your legs stand another recorded winter like that? Well, I don't stand all winter. Sometimes I lie down. Depends on who she is. <laughs> Ned, making love with cold legs up can cause knee trembling. 
and ruin a man's chances in the old wedding stakes there. Oh. What do you suggest? Leg lag. Leg lag? Leg lag. Leg lag. <laughs> I was invited to the investiture ball when Prince Charles was made Prince of Wales. And uh, I was driving up during the ceremony. It was being broadcast on the radio, and I'm driving up there. And I heard the prince's speech in Welsh. And I heard the word goon mentioned. And I, I said to mine, I, yeah, I didn't know there was a Welsh word, goon. And then, of course, when he actually oh, said the speech in English, it was, uh, Wales had produced many, a poet, tragedian, and... Uh, a very memorable goon. And then he drove off the road. <laughs> Uh, and, and of course, you know, he's, he's always been a great Goon Show fan. He can do all the voices. He really can. Right, now, what do you think of that trip? I didn't like it. Well, I didn't like it either. It's absolutely rubbish. Look, you're supposed to go to LZ7. You end up at the wrong one. You pick up the wrong people in the wrong place. Never. Come on, why? They jumped it out, the one, one out of the other. The way you were flying it, they probably wanted to jump out. Just because you've got bigger legs than I have? Absolutely. You think lovely. you can tell me what to do? Yeah. Look, I will tell you one thing and one thing only. Before we finish, I'm in charge. It's all your fault. It's not my fault. Please. I charge It is your fault. You don't remember. Do. You get it all wrong. No, it's your fault. I remember once I said, if anything happened to you all, like, God forbid, you could join us. It'll be a case of air today and goon tomorrow. <laughs> he said, it's very drafty at the tower this time of year, Ned. <laughs> I'll get my own back on him if it's the last thing I do. Yes, I will! Oh, what a lovely thing to pass on to your children. <laughs> you look at the goons and you see a line, I think, that runs straight through, because you can hear in there, you can hear the goodies, you can hear Monty Python, you can hear uh, Vic Rees and Bob Mortimer, you can hear... All these things, and all these things are subsequent, and you realise that, that it's almost like Captain Scott and Amundsen, that the goons got there first, they pitched up their tent, and everything since has been uh, <laughs> looking back to the originality and uh, the, the creativity, or the madness, in fact, of, of Spike and the goons. Mary Poppins is a junkie! <laughs> it was the birth of, of alternative comedy. That was it there. And people don't know how to inf uh, to uh, analyse or, or define alternative comedy anymore. But it is just this this other thing. It, it isn't mainstream. You do have to buy into it. Steady on my mind. I am Ace Blue Bottle. Nine in Fleet Street, a scoop Blue Bottle. Wonder Boy Reporter. What paper do you represent? Brown paper. <laughs> it's Professor Echo. Oh. The brains behind. What? What the? <laughs> behind a windscar disaster. It's a passionate surrealism, and I, I, that, that may be a contradiction in terms, but Spike is a very passionate man, and there was um, a... Th it's a thin skin surrealism. Uh, that's very rare. Uh, he had the ability to... to care about something and turn it into nonsense in order to prove his point. The prison was full of British officers who had sworn to die rather than be captured. <laughs> He's never lost a sense of the absurd. I mean, that, that's, I think, where I feel most close to Spike. I look at life and I look at what we're all doing and I think, this is ridiculous, aren't we? We are taking ourselves seriously. We must be balmy. Look at the way we dress, look at the way we walk, look at what we do, you know. And, and Spike's always had that sense of, of the absurd. It's been very, very close to his comedy and I, I think probably... I think it's it's also made him feel sometimes a bit desperate about the human condition. You can't always laugh at it. He's remains the finest comedy mind in terms of explosions of extraordinary originality uh, and uh, ability to turn things on their head that I've ever met. And, and I, I have worked with some of great people, Buster Keaton, people like that sort of, but Spike remains unique. Charming little stringy chinless agent, what are the secret orders? You are to follow me to the football stadium, and there we are to insert dynamite in the football boots of every Hungarian player. Then when they kick the ball, hey, hey. 
So that's the plan, eh? Right. Follow me to page 23. The jokes are funnier there. <laughs> that's all here. In here, lads. I wrote, I wrote. This is their changing room. Those must be their boots. Now insert the dynamite in the toe caps. Right. <laughs> here, Echoes. How are these three red sticks of dynamite? Oh, wait. One of these isn't a stick of dynamite. Are you sure about that? Echo? One of them was a stick of Blackpool rock. Of course yeah. I'm sure. Just come in. <laughs> of course I could be wrong, you know. Where to go? Look at that. Uh, look at those echoes. He's blowed all his teeth out of his old cake <laughs> uh, What a funny looking old. Goon Show has never been rated as if it was a major contribution to to British culture, or if it is, it's been rather condescended to as if it was a contribution to British popular culture. I think it's of the same importance as Alice in Wonderland, and probably of the same importance as things like the Pickwick Papers. Uh, it's it's a it's it's a major monument in British cultural life, and I think that Milligan particularly, I think, deserves to be seen not just simply as a comic entertainer. Now, this sounds rather pretentious, but I think that he's a, he's, he, he's a major imaginative artist of the 20th century. It's the godfather of modern comedy. I think that's what the goons is. Well, I've got an idea. Follow me. <laughs> and on that note, we end the show. However, here is an alternative ending. Cynthia? Cynthia, darling? It's me, Tom. Oh, hello, Tom. I didn't know you'd come back. You didn't say hello. <laughs> I've missed you a lot, Tom. You know, it's been sort of lonely without you here, isn't it? <laughs> Yes, I... I've been a fool about you. Oh, it's all right. We all get like that, you know. <laughs> this, 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 this parcel, it, it's for you. Oh, and it's it lovely. <laughs> I love to get a parcel, you know. Because I don't often get them, you know, and I like to... Ooh. Darling, <laughs> this thing is bigger than both of us. Oh, God. <laughs> It's an elephant. <laughs> I can't wait any longer. We're getting married tonight. So that night, Tom married an elephant. <laughs> it was strange that four fellows on a Sunday afternoon getting slightly soiled on brandy in between the shows made such a, an impact on the, on the world of comedy. Good luck, Milligan Seacombe. Where are you, folks? <laughs> I suppose I should be pretty proud of uh, the goon show. <coughs> Because, in the long run, I realised we uh, changed the direction of the world of humour. In fact, in some cases, I think some of the shows reached a level which no other humour has reached. Packers? Yep. Let us play a game and push him down the well. Yeah. He's falling in the water. Have to get an input. was Heroes of Comedy, The Goon Show, featuring Peter Sellers, Harry Seacom and Spike Milligan, with the Ray Ellington Quartet and Max Geldrick. The orchestra was conducted by Wally Stott, script by Spike Milligan, announcer Wallace Greenslade. The original programmes were produced by John Browell, Charles Chilton, Pat Dixon, Peter Eaton and Dennis Main Wilson. What were you trying to say? Me. I was trying to say me. It was me coming out here. Yeah. I apportioned the blame, mind you. <laughs>